Hi guys, welcome back. These are pretty unusual, I think you'll agree. We've got sort of two objects to show you today, only it's sort of four and then sort of not at the same time. Very, very unusual configuration, as I'm sure you would agree with me, and we have two of them. Now, if we can try to ignore the, uh, the, the weird mystery that's going on here, which I'll explain in, in a moment, these are somewhat generic percussion fired pocket pistols. If we, again, if we can ignore this bit, they're of uh, Belgian style and they were indeed made in Belgium. They have Belgian proof marks that we'll show you in a moment when we get into why on earth we're showing you these properly. So they're not in themselves that impressive or unusual, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. They do have really nice uh, burl wood stocks or grips. They've got little silver escutcheon plates on those grips with nothing in them. They're, they're there for, for customers to have engraved if they wish, essentially. Some quite nice decoration in the bare iron box locks. Uh, so foliage on pretty much all of the major surfaces. About 1850, probably. No maker's mark, um, no date, but that's not unusual. The only marks on these things are the proof marks. So while we're, while we're at it, we have the oval ELG, which is the standard Belgian proof mark pre-1894. If you find one with a crown on top of it, that means it's 1894 onwards. Not a huge help with dating, especially not when you're dealing with something like this that kind of dates itself, but that's on there. And in this case, that's on the barrel. So, and the barrels are screw off barrels, which is gonna become significant in a moment. And then below that we have a, I believe it's an inspector's mark, a crown over a G. And I don't know or haven't been able to find the significance of that. So each of these four guns has the proof mark and the inspector's mark, all the same incidentally. Okay, time to stop beating around the bush here and tell you what on earth is going on with two pocket pistols stuck together with a single barrel, which is what we've got here. Now, as you'll have seen, uh, probably on, on here, if not elsewhere, these are what we call turn off barrels. So you would unscrew the barrels anyway for loading, that's how they're loaded. Check out our video on the Lancaster pair of pocket pistols if you'd like to see a really, really good example of how that actually worked. So we'd unscrew them anyway. Um, we have our uh, powder chamber and our the little dish shape for putting a lead ball on and then you screw the barrel on, keeps everything in place, keeps the pressure as high as you can get out of this thing, making it more effective. It's a great system. In this case, it doubles up as a way to attach these two guns together. Why would you want to do that? Well, these two come from the collection of uh, Francois Renkin, who was a Belgian, well, it's a Belgian gun maker. Um, the latest, the, the sort of um, mid to late 19th century chief of a company that went back to 18, uh, sorry, 1772. So a very old Belgian firm of gun makers. So this Renkin was also a firearms collector. And in 1966, uh, we, uh, we were then the Tower Armouries, the Tower of London, collected a load of, well, basically we took on that whole Rankin Brothers, which was the firm collection, and these came with that. So that is tempting to, to, to think that, well, he, they must have been the maker of these things. Well, we don't know that because this was a, you know, he was an avid gun collector, especially weird and wonderful stuff. So... We can't say that, we don't know who made them, but we know that there were three pairs of these at least, because there's one set uh, that was sold um, back to Belgium um, in the 40s, or well, stayed in Belgium, sorry, in 1946. It's in a museum in Belgium. And then we have these two. So why did Rankin collect these? It's the fascinating barrel thing, and that comes down to a legal loophole. You'll probably be familiar with barrel length being a defining characteristic of different legal classifications of firearms in various countries around the world. 
It's a similar thing here. So allegedly, and this information comes from the Rankin collection, so, uh, the Italian states, so this was before Italy was a, a nation state, and unspecified other countries had laws on pistol barrel length. So you had to have a pistol, a pistol to be imported into that country had to have a minimal, minimum length barrel. Too short and it was too concealable, too dodgy, too at risk of assassinating somebody important, so it wasn't allowed in. If, however, you brought the pistol in with the barrel over a certain length and then cut it down, that was a way around it. And somebody came up with an even cleverer scam, if scam is the right word, uh, way around the law, that if you had two guns attached by a single long barrel, you could then import one as an incomplete pistol. And the implication here is that that didn't count because it didn't have a barrel, therefore the minimum length didn't count. It's all a little hazy, but... So that's, that's able to be imported as an incomplete thing. And then you import the other half separately as a barrel with a legal permitted barrel. Then you cut that in half, you screw each half back onto its parent gun, and they would only fit the gun that they're fitted to by hand, by the way, without a lot of refiling that might not work, because you've got to keep that pressure seal there as well, by the way. So essentially what you end up doing is just cutting that whole assembly in half, and you've got two normal pocket pistols. All rather convoluted, um, very hard to fully verify in terms of finding the law of the various... Italian states and others that are, that are alluded to by the Rankin Collection here, but I trust the, them, their expertise, and quite frankly, can you think of a better explanation for why these things exist? Now, the last thing uh, to show you, I suppose, is the difference between the two that we have, or the four that we have. Maths was never my strong suit. They are very similar in broad terms, so you know, they almost look like pairs to each other, but they're not. The hammers are slightly different in shape. Uh, the, the, the hammer on this top set is much chunkier. The configuration of the box locks is actually different as well. One is sort of, um, sort of nips in. The other one is a step shape. The decoration is, is quite different as well on both of these all over. So they're superficially of, of a type, but they are different in every detail, basically. And the most obvious reflection of that is, the, is that very long, silly barrel that's joined in the middle, because this set has an octagonal barrel that was you know, destined to become two barrels, but never did. And no, we're not going to get the hacksaw out. Uh, and the other one is round section, just a straightforward round section. But they are really quite beautifully made. They are Damascus barrels. Um, I have to do that for my edge weapons colleagues who will um, have a go at me if I call them Damascus without scare quotes for historical reasons to do with what Damascus steel truly was, which is Woots steel. We won't go there. Suffice to say, lots of guns, especially shotguns for, for many decades, were made with this very attractive pattern welding. That's what it really should be called. In fact, there's a, a really good um, short series of articles from our friend Matthew Moss over at the uh, Armourer's Bench where he explains Damascus steel both in an edge weapons context and in a firearms context. Anyway, if we look at this uh, up close, I'll sort of try and rotate it so it catches the light, it has that sort of ripple effect of fairly classic Damascus barrel uh, a, a fairly classic Damascus barrel that you might see on a, on a shotgun. It's probably the usual place you'd see them. It's not super common on pocket pistols, but it does happen. So that's that one. And then the other one is quite an interesting mixture of a spiral twist with the sort of ripples in bands between the spirals. Really quite nice to look at. Um, it would almost be a shame to ruin them by cutting the barrel in half to create the two pistols that these were supposed to be because that continuous sort of rod of iron is really quite nice. 
And that's about it, guys. Um, there are rear sights on these. I don't know if the gun, a gunsmith at the other end was expected to, to fit bead front sights. I assume they must have been. Otherwise, why would there be rear sights? It, just a front sight is, is still useful. You can still use that as an aiming point. Did it for centuries with muskets. But just a rear sight is of less use because it, you know, your, your, your sighting system is essentially pivoting around and the muzzle can be going anywhere. Whereas with a front sight, you can at least use that as a, a reference and it will be a lot more accurate. So long story short, they must have been planning to put little brass beads or maybe even gold beads on the end of what would become the barrel on each of these. Now, just in case you haven't come across this type before, you will, we will certainly be scratching your head as to how the hell you fire these things off, because where's the trigger? Well, if we cock the thing, nothing happens, because we're only on half cock. If we take it all the way to the rear, you can see a little trigger pops out of the bottom of the gun, and it's so well fitted that it's absolutely, well, it's not seamless, of course. In fact, they do decorate around it so that you can sort of see that there's a, a trigger there, but it's it's basically undetectable. Um, you might even think it was part of the decoration, in fact, if you didn't know what a gun was and how it fired. <laughs> so that's this is how, this is at, uh, standard with box lock pocket pistols. It's generally how they do it, um, below a certain size, I should say. If they're more like a sort of coat pocket pistol, then they'll have a conventional trigger and a trigger guard to protect it. These don't need a trigger guard because all you do is snap the trigger shut, which is a very satisfying sound. So I'm often kind of complaining about um, the only real downside of our collection, which is that we often don't know who owned these things. Well, here we actually do. Uh, Mr. Rankin, uh, or M Monsieur Rankin, um, this, these were part of his personal collection, and we know that no purchaser ever got their hands on these because they were never cut in half and turned into two pistols. So we know about as much that, as we ever could about these. The other sort of legacy or, or contemporary relevance of these might be, you know, there are various ways in which firearms manufacturers today and, and dealers as well have to work around national and local laws. And a lot of those do pertain to things like barrel length. Um, in, in the United States, the difference between a pistol and a rifle, it, there's more to it, but barrel length is, is important. Um, uh, civilian legal firearms in many countries have a minimum barrel length as well. And the, the idea is to do with concealability, which by extrapolation, is what they were trying to do here. Why else would they have banned short barreled pistols? Thanks as always for watching everybody. We appreciate it all the more right now because we've actually just passed uh, 200,000 subscribers. Um, really can't thank you enough for, for boosting us up past that milestone. Um, needless to say, we would like even more. So please do continue to like, subscribe, hit the bell, all the usual YouTube stuff. Um, keep an eye on this channel. You can catch me over on the GameSpot uh, video game channel as well, still. We're still doing that. We have our um, reams of social media content as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We even have an old-fashioned website and an even more old-fashioned set of three physical sites that you can come and visit as well, which we'd also appreciate you doing, uh, especially while the weather's nice. Take care, guys. Thank you very much.